Do you ever dread going to a particular meeting because of the toxic atmosphere? And do you feel like many of the meetings you attend just sap your energy and could be done and dusted in half the time? And do you know that there are issues in the room which are being swept under the carpet and left unsaid, but are actually running the show? In this episode, Jane Gunn, friend of the show, lawyer and the barefoot mediator, returns to the podcast to talk about conflict in meetings and how to make them, well, just better. We talk about why people find it so hard to speak up and say what they actually think and how learning to run or be a participant in an effective meeting is a crucial skill that we're just not taught at med school. And we discuss simple ways to help people speak up, to share better and to make sure our meetings actually work. So listen, if you want to find out how to get everybody to speak up about what they actually think, even if it's awkward. Listen, if you want to find out why acting like a dinner party host might just be the best way to chair a meeting. And find out the surprising power of 10 and how this can help you bring up even the most tricky of issues. Welcome to You Are Not A Frog, the podcast for doctors and other busy professionals who want to beat burnout and work happier. I'm Dr Rachel Morris. I'm a GP, now working as a coach, speaker and specialist in teaching resilience. Even before the coronavirus crisis, we were facing unprecedented levels of burnout. We have been described as frogs in a pan of slowly boiling water. We hardly noticed the extra long days becoming the norm and have got used to feeling stressed and exhausted. Let's face it, frogs generally only have two options. Stay in the pan and be boiled alive or jump out of the pan and leave. But you are not a frog and that's where this podcast comes in. It is possible to craft your work and life so that you can thrive even in difficult circumstances. And if you're happier at work, you'll simply do a better job. In this podcast, I'll be inviting you inside the minds of friends, colleagues and experts, all who have an interesting take on this, so that together we can take back control and love what we do again. We're delighted to announce that the doors to our Resilient Team Academy online membership are now open until the 3rd of November only. By joining our community of busy leaders in health and social care, you'll get the Shapes Toolkit core training. You'll get monthly webinars, which you can join live or watch in your own time. You'll get bite-sized videos and team resilience building activities, plus coaching demos and much more. The Resilient Team Academy will give you simple tools so that you can support your team for resilience, productivity and well-being, help them deal with the overwhelm, and get you a happy and thriving team without burning out yourself. You can join individually or we have special deals for organisations such as PCNs. Find out more in the show notes. It's wonderful to have with me on the podcast back for, I think, the third time, uh, Jane Gunn. So welcome, Jane. Hello, Rachel. Lovely to see you again or or hear you again. Now, Jane, for those of you that have not come across her before, Jane is the Barefoot Mediator. She's a lawyer and a mediator. She's also the upcoming president of the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators. So congratulations on that appointment. Thank you. Thank you. Well, well deserved. Well, it's really nice to have you back because the episodes that you have done around difficult conversations, around conflicts, are some of our most popular ever. And I think it's just a topic that everybody struggles with and we're all pretty scared of. But let's just rewind back and I just wanted to ask you again, I know I'll probably ask you all the time, but why is it that we, who are used to having difficult conversations with patients and customers and clients, why do we fear conflict so much among ourselves and our colleagues? I just ran a workshop yesterday, actually, and there were uh, uh, the top reason was we're afraid of our own emotions. You know, if it's something that's important to us, we're afraid how we might react in front of someone who's important to us. So if it's a a business colleague or a family member or someone that we actually respect and value, then we're slightly afraid that we might damage that relationship or trigger some reaction that we can't that we can't manage. And, and, And also, I suppose the second reason that came out of the poll I did yesterday was that we don't feel somewhere we've got exactly the right words or the right skills to to navigate through the conversation as it develops. And it's those two things, I think, really. 
Yeah. I think that's quite helpful to think of it that way, because if we think of it as a skill, then we think, great, well, a skill is something that I can develop and I can get better at. I remember when I was teaching communication and then, then professionalism, you know, 25, 30 years ago we, in medicine, we used just to think communication was innate, that you either could communicate or you couldn't. And then all the research said, no, it's a skill. Like some people are maybe naturally better at it than others, but actually you can teach people the skills that you need to do it. Mm -hmm. Same with resilience. You can teach people the skills you need to, to be resilient. Although I'm, I'm getting slightly allergic to the word resilience, it has to be said but con <laughs> <laughs> in this day and age, but conflict, you're saying these difficult conversations are a skill that we can all learn. Yes, absolutely. And it's a skill that many of us either don't have adequately or have overridden because so much of the way we we are we're wired is to be adversarial is to be triggered by things so you know we're naturally actually not good at it i suppose because we are easily triggered and also you know we are quite adversarial by nature as human beings mm. now that's interesting because my experience working in healthcare is that with a few notable exceptions most of us sweep the conflict under the carpet and mm -hmm. don't address things but you're saying that's because we are by nature quite adversarial. We know that any little thing is going to is going to trigger us, and we'd rather just avoid it than go through that that pain. Yeah. So we have four ways that we typically we typically manage conflict. We either do the fight or flight thing, and actually, you know, flight is is running away, or, or we freeze. So either the running away or the freezing might be the sweeping something under the carpet. I'm not going to deal with it today, or I don't, you know, I just don't know what to do. And the fourth thing is we appease, we give in, we, you know, or we try and placate someone else. So those are our typical go to ways of processing conflict. And we have to understand that, you know, what what do I generally myself do when I'm triggered? Do I do I get defensive? Do I tend to do I tend to sort of avoid it and, and brush it under the carpet? The brushing under the carpet is often because we've got the timing wrong. It's like, well, I can't deal with that now. And actually a question I got in a workshop I was running yesterday is, is it a good idea to leave it? Do these things generally go away? And the answer is no, they don't actually. Yeah, they fester, don't they? they yeah. Uh, yeah. And then you see that person again, you think, oh, they did that and I still haven't raised it. And then, and then it becomes just... You've avoided it for so long that actually then to raise it would just be really, really yes. awkward. Yes. Yeah, yeah. But, I mean, is your experience of working with teams that there isn't enough conflict around or is it that it's too much conflict around or? I, I guess it's that we just approach it wrong. You know, there are some teams that do have too much conflict. People are just not getting on. But people think that having conflict is a sign the team isn't working but I like to think about conflict as water. You know, it's actually a resource that you need. It's something that uh, waters your garden and helps it grow. And if you didn't have it, it would be dry and arid and nothing would, would grow and develop. And so it, what we do with water is we channel it. We go, oh, I know it's going to rain. I'll stick an umbrella up or I'll put a water butt in my garden. But we, we catch it and we channel it. We know where it needs to go. And when, and that's what we don't do with conflict. We don't say, well, you know, now's not a good time, but let's talk as soon as possible. And this is what we need to do. We need to set up a meeting. You know, we need to make the time and space for it. Here's the skills and tools we need to have that conversation. You know, the whole structure around it just doesn't happen. I love that analogy. That That is really helpful. Conflict is necessary, but you, you've got to channel it and you've got to do it right. And you're right, so much of conflict is just done off the hoof when we are in that sympathetic triggered system. And, and then it never mm -hmm. goes well, does it? Because you're not really thinking with your your human thinking brain. You're thinking with your you're in a chimp and it it just all goes yeah. all goes horribly wrong. It does. It does. And so I, I know you've you've got a course called The Power of Resolution Rethinking. Yes. I love that. I love that. What is the difference between sort of resolutionary thinking and then the way that we typically was try and try and do conflict. So I've been on a number of boards uh, and helped a number of people with meetings. And I think often we don't, when we think about resolutionary thinking, we don't think through 
issues and and quite often in in meetings that's where challenges and issues are aired we don't have a process of thinking how are we going to process this issue this thing we need to make a decision about and decision making is is a big part of life at the moment we need to make some critical decisions in our workplaces that impact a lot of people so i've gone back to what's the process that i would use as a mediator to help people to reach a resolution to create the right meetings and the right solutions so rather than just thinking of decisions as just decisions that need to be made we need to think of every decision as a potential conflict situation in a way, is that what you're saying? Well, in a way, because if people aren't happy with it, then you're going to get some kickbacks. So when you think about dealing with a crisis or, or something or any decision, I suppose, particularly if it's being made at a high level, there are two ways in which you can make that decision. You either decide and then you announce what, the, what you're going to do and then you defend it. So, you know, in an organisation, a message comes from the top down. We're going to be doing this from Monday. That's it. You know, and everybody's going, oh, I had no idea that was happening. And and so you risk getting some kickback or you you consult and then you you agree and then you and then you implement. I um I was just doing some research on this this week and I remember going to visit uh, Toyota, the car manufacturers, and they have this wonderful process called Nemawashi. And nemawashi means we have to dig around the roots. It means we must dig deep with this issue and we must understand what it's about before we make a decision. We don't just do that, decide, announce, defend. And I guess that's one of the things I'm suggesting. Let's dig deep with this. Let's find out what it's about, what the potential impact might be. So let's, you know, look at this in a in a more holistic way, I suppose. That's interesting. So do you think that the main place that we go wrong with decisions and conflicts is we haven't done that consulting bit enough? Yeah, sometimes. I mean, I know I know many people say, well, we don't need to consult or if we consult, we get too many opinions. And of course, there are levels at which you consult and how much you're actually going to sort of allow other people to be part of the decision making. But I think when people have even been allowed to have a voice then they feel heard and then they feel as though they've participated. There's another workshop I'm actually going to be running for the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators, which is called The Power of Participation and the Value of Voice, how valuable it is to enable people to feel heard and to participate, even if they don't necessarily get a vote. And it makes sense to know what people actually think and feel about an issue, if it's an important issue. I was just reflecting on a meeting I was in a couple of days ago where there were lots of people there and they were being consulted about stuff. And a lot of the time they were, they'd come on, it was, it was on Zoom again, they'd come mm. on, they'd, they'd say their piece and then that was them have, having been consulted and then you move to the next person who said their piece. But I came away thinking, I wonder if that person has really been consulted. They've just sort of said their piece, but um, there's loads behind that. I'm sure yes. there's some stories going on in their head. There's some things that they're not, they're not saying that they feel uncomfortable saying here. And it didn't feel like if a decision was made, they would have really felt that they'd been heard. Yeah. And so what I don't know what was happening in that that meeting, Rachel, because obviously I wasn't there. But what you do need is what we do in mediation is to have somebody facilitating that conversation who is summarising back to those people what they heard. But then maybe summarising what are some of the key issues that came out of people who chose to speak. Checking also, is there somebody in the audience who isn't speaking who would like to speak? Because often some people are more vocal than others. And there might be somebody who sits there extremely quiet, but has the best ideas and they don't get heard. So that's what I mean about the power of participation and the value of voice. Is everybody who wants to speak speaking? How do we hear them? How do we acknowledge what they're saying? How do we make sure that forms part of a big picture so we know what came out of all of those voices? And then what do we do with that? What was the point of that? Where do we go with that information? How do we summarise that down and say, well, look, 
you know, here are some key issues that have come out of this. I'm just thinking back to some meetings that I've been in where maybe a, a smaller group meeting, maybe a, maybe a partnership or maybe just one team. And someone has said something and it's been obvious that there's been some stuff behind what they've said, but we haven't dug into that because oh. it's been a bit scary to go there. And then we've, we've just carried on and just thought, well, that they didn't, they didn't have their say and actually they weren't going to bring it up. So let's just, let's just go ahead. What, what should you do when you know that there's something behind what they're saying? There's a thing behind the thing. There's maybe some odd stories going on in their head or some con concerns or anxieties. You haven't uncovered them, but actually worried that if you do uncover them, that their proverbial stuff is going to hit the fan. It's a challenge. And I guess there's two parts to this, Rachel. You know, do you do it in the meeting where it might all kick off and, uh, uh, and upset the meeting? You know, is it important to hear those things in the meeting because you've got to make a decision and you ought to bear those things in mind? Or do you take it away from the meeting and go and see that person and set up a separate meeting and say, you know, I heard what you said in the meeting. I'm just wondering if we could explore that a bit further or if I could hear where your concerns come from. And, you know, I think probably the latter is often more appropriate is to sort of have a quiet meeting with that person and explore what was going on. And as we've said before, you know, if you don't do that, perhaps that person is going to fester with those things for a long time. It does just seem a little bit, uh, what's the word, onerous. Yeah. <laughs> that the facilitated meetings is always having to think, what's that person thinking? Have we got out everything they need? Is there any unresolved issues here? It's almost like I'd be thinking, come on, like if you've got something to say, just say it and then don't whinge when we when we haven't addressed your issues if you haven't raised it. Well, you know what, Rachel, one of the key things, and again, it goes, it, it goes back to how do we have better meetings? And one of the things is to frame the meetings. So if you were to say at the beginning of the meeting, do you know what, exactly what you've just said, it's really important that everybody says what they're thinking and we do it in a way that's respectful, but you, you set up some, some kind of ground rules or some expectations about what you would like people to do in the meeting, how you'd like people to address something and say, you know, if you've got an issue about this, please speak up. Here's how we'd let. So I think what we're quite bad at is we set up a meeting and then we just Roll into it. We don't set up in our mind or even in our agenda. You know, an agenda is usually just a list of issues we're going to talk about. It doesn't set up how we're going to talk about those issues and how we're going to make the decision or any decisions that need to be made. Yeah, that that makes sense. You set it up at the beginning. You say, look, actually, this is your forum to be able to be able to speak. We really want to know what you think. This is a safe space. Yes. Hopefully. Yeah. <laughs> Although sometimes yeah. it's not. I mean, what what yeah. if, and I have been in practices where, you know, you've been brought in to deal with a particular issue, which is the elephant in the room, and no one bring it up. And it's, mm -hmm. it's there in that meeting and you know it's there, everyone else knows it's there and that's what's running the show. But people are so worried about even bringing it up that they, they just don't talk about it and it becomes about everything else but not that elephant. I, I guess you get that sometimes as a GP with patients, don't you? They'll tell you all sorts of things, and then and then it's the and is there anything else or was there something else? <laughs> it's, yeah. Oh, by the way, yes, there was. <laughs> but that's the same in meetings, absolutely the same. You know, we'll hold back and hold back. Think, well, maybe someone else will raise it. So, I guess it's part of this comes back to values, actually, Rachel. And you know, are we clear? in a partnership, what our values are. And, you know, if our values are about being open and honest, for example, then we expect that we do have these conversations. So I think it is about, and you mentioned also about safety, you know, why is it that people aren't speaking up? Many of us are afraid to speak up in meetings, but we have to understand what it is we're afraid of. We're afraid of the backlash. We're afraid that this isn't really a safe space, you know, that we're going to compromise ourselves in front of our colleagues or that, that they'll think less of us. Many of us are afraid of being less than, of being perceived as less than or being criticised by our colleagues. And that 
is one of the things that holds us back. So it, it, I guess it's a question of h- how do you do that in a way where it's acceptable for anybody to say things that are important to them. And if they wouldn't be said in a meeting, is there another way that you could, can you do an anonymous poll that would get thing get issues out? You know, it is possible even in a small practice to do an anonymous poll, even only of the partners, you know, the poll I did yesterday, which was actually with a law firm, is to say, actually, what stops you from dealing with conflict around here? And everybody voted anonymously. And you can even do that in the meeting because I used a, I used an online tool now called Mentimeter. People just go on their phones and vote and you don't see who voted what. But immediately you've got, oh, like the main reason we don't do it here is because of this. And you put those answers in. So even in a meeting, you can have anonymous polling where people can say, this is what I'm afraid of, or this is what I'm worried about. Again, you've got to set it up before the meeting. You've got to have some structure and framework and know you're going to ask those questions. But it's it's thinking about what are some strategies that I can employ to make people feel safe to say things. So I love the thought that you can get together with a load of people with the same values and be in a team with them and you're all going to be the same, you know, it all, you've got the same motivations and insights and, and, and intents. In my experience of people that are in partnerships together, they may have been in partnerships together for 20, 25 years. You might get new people coming in. Often they're not focusing on having common values. They are mm. literally a group of people that are just working together. They've got mm. very different values. They've got very different stuff going on. There's different hierarchies. Even if you're in a partnership, different people want different things. They're not really functioning as a team. They're functioning as a working group. Yes. And things have been swept under the carpet and things are really, really difficult and so no matter how much you say we need to be open and honest here they just aren't and and then stuff comes out in in other ways you know I don't know if that's been your experience of some places where you've worked hugely actually I mean I think Rachel it, it, it's quite a it's quite a new concept if you like that we in in any organization of any size explore and think consciously what's the culture here what what are we trying to create as a group and what values we would like to behave in accordance with every time we meet together as a group and in the way we address each other when we're speaking privately and in the way we address our patients and anybody else who comes into contact with us you know what are those core values so it's really important to know to know your values and that's quite a big um, amount of work that you have to do with a team to do that. And, and everyone needs to be quite, I guess, quite up for it. Really, <laughs> What would you, what sort of tips and techniques? And I guess what I'm asking, Jane, is a shortcut. Do you have a yeah. shortcut for a meeting where there's a bit of a conflict around? It's a bit hidden. We need to uncover it, but we haven't got time to do a big team coaching piece with our values and things like that. Mm-hmm. We actually need mm-hmm. to make a decision that everyone's going to buy into even though there's some differences of opinions what what would you advise there one of the things i think is really important that people miss is being clear about what your criteria for a decision are so even in a meeting where you've got to make a quick decision one of the things i was often asked as a chair of the board is on what criteria are we making this decision do we all agree today on the criteria is it important to do it for this reason or this reason you know and i think very often we just say, here's the issue. Uh, we need to make a decision. Let's make a decision. But people are still deciding from their own personal viewpoint rather than here's an agreed set of criteria. So that's certainly something we would do or I would do in a mediation is to say, OK, what what are the criteria for making this decision? And I think that could be a quick way round in a, in a meeting is just let's do a piece of let's just be very clear about what the criteria are for this particular decision yeah i love that because that's that's the real depersonalization technique isn't it yeah so it's no longer a, now no longer about what you're thinking and feeling what they're feeling it's like okay are we deciding this on cost yes. are we d- yes d- deciding this on workload or yes um convenience or yes patient safety or this or that and yeah and then you can be yeah then you can look at it rationally can't you really yeah it is it is about rationalizing it but do we all agree on the rationale because we might be making it from 
even a very personal standpoint, you know, one of the boards I was chairing, we had to make a decision about where a meeting would be. And it's like, is that because you'd like to go to that place or is it because, you know, is it a cost thing? You know, you've got to understand where people's personal preferences cross the boundary as well. But I can see how that would be actually quite good to be having a discussion about the criteria rather than the decision, right? Yes. And then the decision is easy because they yeah. say, well, you know, it, it, OK, on that basis, let's all vote. Yeah, it might, you might be, you've got several. It might be, OK, cost is the number one, but below that is something else. But once you're clear about that, a lot of what and a lot of what people find difficult and what I cover in my courses is this thing called clarity, reaching clarity. I find that many people are stuck in what I call the murky swamp of reality. And <laughs> it's, it's love like, that. I'm not clear. I'm not clear what the issues are. I'm not clear what people are thinking. I'm not clear what the criteria are. I'm not clear what the options are. So it's getting clarity, getting clear at each stage. What's this actually about? Where are we trying to get to? What are some of the options that are available to us? What are the criteria? And how, how do we make a decision? And then sometimes what are the long and short term implications? Sometimes we're not looking long enough into the future and saying, oh, this is great, a decision for this week. But in six weeks time or even in six years time, you know, that won't have been the right decision. And that's important, isn't it? Otherwise, you are just left making decisions based on your feelings. Yes. And that's not hugely reliable, although... I know that feelings are really, really important, aren't they, in all of this? So what, what is the role of people's mm. feelings in stuff like this? Well, there's lots of things, aren't there? There's your sort of emotions going on. And then there's something, you know, when we're talking about logic, you've got intuition. And I know that's a big topic, but, you know, sometimes you have a gut feeling that something isn't quite right and you need to explore that. That's, I suppose that's easier on a personal level than it is in a group because to try and explain what your intuition is telling you or your gut is telling you is quite hard in a group setting. But I, I find that it's really important to be able to explore those things because usually, a, a, usually an intuitive feeling comes from something that's happened to you before and didn't quite go right and you think, oh, something's ringing an alarm bell here. So I think it is important to take the time to think rather than rushing headlong into decision making. And I think sometimes we're trying to do things too quickly. And it's like the difference between a motorboat and a sailing boat. If you're in a motorboat, you want to go from A to B and you want to go as quickly as possible and you will carve through every wave that comes at you, you'll carve through the weather and you'll get to be as fast as possible. If you're in a sailing boat, you tack, you go from side to side, you go in a zigzag. And if the wind and the waves are not in your favour, you might end up at port C instead of point B, because that's the right place to go. And I think that's the difference between the motorboat approach and the sailing boat approach. And, you know, sometimes you've got to decide, OK, this is urgent. We've got to make a motorboat approach to this. We've got to make a quick decision. Other times. Take the time to process it, take the time to think and take the time to set up a meeting that is much more structured and that's covering all the things we've talked about. I 100% agree on that. So most of us react you know, far too fast, don't we? And then we're in our bike, flight or freeze, yeah, our chimp zones and making yep. decisions out of that is, is never any good. However, I have seen the opposite is that no one will make any decisions exactly. and then they get deferred yes. and they get deferred. And they get to fed. And I presume that's because they haven't gone through those, the clarity and the, the proper thinking that needs doing. Yeah, I think if you if you've got a structure and you know which stage of the structure you're at, now we're at now we're at looking at options, now we're at agreeing criteria, then you know because what happens when you're delaying something is it comes up at the next meeting and you just go around the block again, don't you? You just that well, we'll start where we started last time, where we'll end up where we ended up last time and then we'll say well let's put this off until next time <laughs> yeah as soon as it gets difficult you put it off as yes. soon as it it becomes yeah. oh my gosh right this is there's going to be some emotions some feelings ah someone's not gonna be happy and we might have to talk about that elephant we just okay let, let's think about it a bit more and delay it and it's so frustrating when that happens 
I think the other thing, uh, Rachel, that's occurring to me as we talk is, you know, you do need someone who is a good chair, who's a good facilitator. And of course, as GPs, that's not what you're trained to do. You're trained to do something else. And yet all of a sudden you're in meetings. So who's going to chair that meeting? Who's going to facilitate it? Do they themselves have the skills and the training to facilitate these difficult meetings? Because often they don't and perhaps don't even want to. And so, you know, it doesn't necessarily have to be the senior partner. Perhaps it would be someone else who would chair the meeting. And it isn't a sign of status or anything else. It's a sign of, you know, being able to use the person who's got the best skills at chairing or facilitating. Or maybe you take it in turns and you do try and develop your chairing of meeting skills or your setting up of meeting skills you know that could be a a project where you 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 try and improve your meetings each time it's again it's a skill you have to learn is is meeting chairing yeah I totally agree and I don't think I know anyone who's been on a meeting chairing course even though the further you you progress in your professional life you end up having to chair meetings Mm -hmm. and I was reflecting on what you said just then Jane I mean often in practices it's either the senior partner that chairs and then often it's it's their agenda (laughs) and Mm -hmm. it's their decision they make the final decision and no one really wants to speak up against them and half Mm -hmm. the time they're the problem (laughs) they are the elephant (laughs) but you can't do anything about it or it's the poor old practice manager that has to chair it yes and actually they're the one that has to action most of the actions Mm -hmm. and so they're chairing but they're also responsible for all the stuff that's coming their way and so they're thinking oh my goodness I can't I can't do much more they're being they're being triggered yet they've got to be very neutral whereas I think it's probably quite a difficult place to be yeah and then everyone else is just sitting around thinking well this meeting is isn't going isn't going to plan and I'm not being able to say what what I need to say so I, I don't think we pay enough attention to chairing I like your suggestion about it it, it, it rotating so every, mm. everybody getting a chance yeah on the other hand if you do that then you might end up with someone who's absolutely hopeless and then it's almost like a pointless meeting it's just just thinking of different ways in which you might share that responsibility but also make it more equal as you say it often ends up being the senior partner who sets the agenda you know that's a big question is anybody else allowed to add things to the agenda do they just sit at the end of the agenda and never get so it is about Thinking about creating meetings that are, are run better, that seem fairer, that are, are facilitated properly. And who does that? Perhaps it doesn't get rotated around everybody, but perhaps it gets rotated about people who would like to do it or do have the skills. There's just different different ways. We don't we don't have to go back to the old ways. You know, we don't have to do things always in the same way. And you know, how do you do that? You know, do, are your meetings ordered at a certain time of day? How do you? So how do you create? This is one thing I was about to write a blog on. How do you put the fun back in functional? Because our meetings are very functional and not very much fun. And if you think about, I often say to people, think about your meeting as you're hosting a dinner party, not you're running a meeting. How could you make your meeting more interesting so people enjoy coming to your meeting? They're thinking about, oh, that'll be nice. You know, I know they'll have provided something nice, you know, a surprise or something like that. I I know it's adding another layer of complexity and, oh, God, but actually just think about what's one thing I could do to make this meeting more fun as well as functional. I love that idea of approaching a meeting like a dinner party because you are naturally if you are hosting a dinner party you're thinking is everyone okay here right has everyone had the gravy <laughs> anybody anybody need yes. another drink that person's been a bit quiet are they okay do they have anything to to exactly. contribute yeah and and also you wouldn't let anybody monopolize the conversation and you would also you wouldn't just deliver a monologue about stuff. And I think that the problem with a lot of meetings is we think that they're there for information telling, yes. but they're yes. not. They're, they're, for, they're for making decisions. And I think just thinking back to that whole bit about who chairs it, we, we have stuck in our heads that the chair is the person that makes the decision and is the one in charge. Therefore, why wouldn't it be the senior partner? 
right? But actually, if the chair is literally just there to make the meeting run properly, maybe think about it more as a professional dinner party host. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Think about, you know, has everybody got some snacks and drinks and things? I mean, the simplest thing I do is to take chocolates to meetings. I know it's not, yeah, but, you know, small chocolates. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness, Chocolate. big chocolates, cakes. I mean, I, I still remember the, the study I read about when they were looking at judges in the US and right. parole decisions. And they, they looked at, was there any correlation between whether when, when a prisoner came up for parole, whether the judge would be lenient on them or send them straight back to jail in terms of the prisoner's behavior, their psychological state, if they were sorry for what they'd done. So they looked at all these factors that, 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 that affected the judge's decision making. And the only thing that affected whether the judge was particularly lenient or particularly harsh was the time that had elapsed since the judge had last eaten. Yes, yes, absolutely true. And, and you know, as doctors, you will know that. But as doctors, you know, it's very difficult to practice what you preach. <laughs> you're so busy, you're running around, you've got this and that. So, yes, low blood sugar is a huge factor in conflict, Rachel. When people are low, their blood sugar's low, they are much more likely to, to you know, be triggered and explode. And so it is an important factor. I remember I actually was called in to chair the board meeting of a company and I happened to know from some information I'd gathered that someone was coming late and somebody was coming from the dentist. You know, in other words, they wouldn't have eaten. So I took two things to the meeting with me. One was a large bunch of bananas. And the other one was I just happened to have it at home, actually a huge slab of chocolate. And the interesting thing was it wasn't individual chocolates and the chocolate sat in the centre of the table. And the meeting went on until somebody couldn't bear it anymore. And they picked it up and broke it. But if you're going to break a large slab of chocolate, you've got to break and share it. It was like breaking bread. We're breaking and sharing. And once they'd shared the chocolate, it transformed the meeting, I have to say. Yeah, we just forget we're human beings, don't we? Yeah. We forget that we become really hangry and we really need <laughs> we really need food. And I think it's talk to us, we're rubbish at thinking that. We we skip yeah. breaks, we skip yeah. meals, and often our meetings are are at lunchtime. And then organizations are like, well, we we can't, this is NHS, we can't afford lunch. It's like, okay. Can you not afford a tenner on sandwiches to make this meeting go better? <laughs> but if, if this meeting goes better and might prevent somebody leaving or having to have three more meetings because you've all been shouting at each other or you haven't dealt with the issue. I mean, it was just basic Maslow's hierarchy stuff. So bring bring sugar to a meeting or, or sandwiches or, or hell, I have to say healthy Anything. snacks because this is a podcast about, you know, looking after yourself. But if you know me, please bring chocolate. <laughs> I have to say I'm a chocoholic too. It's very dark chocolate, but I never get anywhere without some snacks because I know that I will get um, grumpy if I don't have them. Oh yeah, totally, totally. So I, I, I'm glad that we've done a whole podcast about conflict and the main take home is <laughs> take chocolate to a meeting. <laughs> uh, but seriously though, Jane, I think that's some really helpful stuff in there. The yes. other thing that's going through my head is what if you are, so I would think a lot of listeners are sitting there thinking, yeah, well, okay, that's all very well and good, but I don't get to chair my meeting. I'm not in charge, mm -hmm. but I have to go to so many meetings that are just so awful. I can see, I can see all this playing out. What can you do as a participant in meetings to help better decisions, to help increase the good, the good conflict and the stuff that needs to come out in the open? I guess a couple of things. I mean, one of the things I cover in my courses is how to how to hear what needs to be said. In other words, how to listen well, and then how to say what needs to be heard. So how do you speak in a way that other people are going to hear what you've got to say? So how to hear what needs to be said. As a participant in a meeting, you can take the role, even if you're not chairing, of listening well to other people around the table. So if someone else has said something important, you yourself could summarise that back. And so what I've heard you just say, well, and the key issue seems to be, did I miss anything? There's nothing wrong in you as an individual doing that. And then when you need to speak to be heard, 
You need to be very clear about what your thoughts are, you know, share your reasoning and intent. So what am I, what's my issue? What am I feeling about it? What's my reasoning and intent? And what would I like to happen as a result? So have, again, have a structure for what you want to say. And then you can ask, has anybody else got anything they'd like to add to that? Or what do other people think? So although you're not chairing, you can still use some of these techniques to ensure that you listen well. Because when you listen well, by summarizing what someone else is saying, you're helping other people to hear that. And you're helping that person to feel heard. And by speaking well, you're helping other people to hear you. So those two things you can do without taking the meeting over, but simply, again, being very clear about what's going on. I love that. Yeah. So you can say, oh, that's an interesting point. Th- thank you, Jane. Can I just check that I've, I've understood that right? So this is exactly. what this is what you mean. Exactly. Um, is, is that what you mean? Is that right? Mm. OK, OK. Mm. That's interesting. Was there anything else? OK, my reflections are this is the assumptions that I've got in my head, what, what I'm thinking here mm-hmm. and you know this is what I would like to happen that would be so powerful if yes, it if, if it just even just a few people did that it's modeling it's showing empathy mm. it's it could take the meeting to a whole a whole different track and you're right you don't need to be the chair to do that you just need to have a little bit of, of self-confidence and 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 yeah. a structure yeah. like like you said can yeah. you just repeat that structure for us so the structure well, the structure about how to say what needs to be said and hear yeah. what needs to be heard. So how to hear what needs to be heard. You just need to listen to what someone's saying. Don't interrupt them. Reflect back. Oh, as you said, here's what I think I just heard you say. That's very interesting. Uh, can I just check that's what it was? Is there anything else? So checking that the person said everything. Then when you want to say what needs to be heard, You need to be very clear what you're saying. Here's the issue or here's what I'm thinking. Here's my reasoning and intent. This is why it's important to me. Here's the outcome I think would be helpful. And, you know, anything else? Where do you think we should go from here? What does anybody else think? One of the key things I think, and I call it this, the power of 10, the power of using language with its tentative. So instead of being instead of being full on <laughs> controlling, you're actually giving power back. We talk in organizational terms about empowerment, but what do we really mean by that? When you're empowering someone, you're giving them the last word. So in saying to someone, here's what I think I heard you say, did I miss anything? You're actually giving the power back to them to go, yes, you didn't even hear me right. You've got it completely wrong, or yes, there is something else. And the same when you're speaking, you can speak and say, here are the things that are important to me. Here's why they're important. Here's what I think we should do. What does anybody else think? And again, you're giving the power back. You're not going in and saying, there's no argument or I'm right and you're wrong. You're just saying, this is my point of view. What's your point of view? This is what I think. What do you think? We, we do an exercise in my training called No Buts. But you mustn't have in your in your brain this idea that I'm saying this and that or I'm listening to you and going, yes, but yes, but I'm right. <laughs> and of course, we all do that. But and I'm saying, but now, but that that attitude to I need to listen to you, but I don't need to listen to you. Yeah. So it's listening to understand as opposed to listening to argue. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. I, I love that thought about the power of 10, you know. When you're offering your your thoughts, always give it back. Is that right? It's just a suggestion. Am I right? Can I check that out? And that automatically gives, yeah, just gives the, the signal that, you know, I could be wrong. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. It's not been known that often, but I could. <laughs> I had to put that in for my husband <laughs> and my family who think that I can never, ever admit that I'm wrong, which uh... <laughs> occasionally I am wrong. <laughs> Just Occasionally, <laughs> the, the other thing that I think is really powerful in what you just said is is making really clear the reasoning and the intent behind what you what you're saying. Because mm-hmm. I think that is a step that we so often miss. We often say what we're thinking, yeah, uh, or what our opinion is, and what we'd like to happen, mm-hmm. and we don't say that reasoning. And the reasoning is 
so important because if you can understand the reasoning, yeah. if it's right, then you can say, oh, yeah, how are we going to sort that out? If it's wrong, you can say, oh, that's interesting. My opinion's this. I'm trying to avoid saying yes, but here. And you can mm-hmm. sort it out. And I do think we have a responsibility as professionals to be able to articulate our reasoning and intent. We do. We do. And we do have a responsibility as professionals, Rachel, to run effective meetings. You know, as lawyers, as mediators, as as doctors, we do have a responsibility to be running our businesses and running our meetings professionally. And we're not trained to do that. I wasn't trained at law school how to run a meeting. I wasn't trained as a trainee lawyer how to run a meeting. It's only in becoming a mediator and a facilitator that I've learnt those skills. And I think there's a gap in professional training for many professionals in not even learning these skills. Totally. I totally agree. And I would even go a bit further and say that there's a gap in learning how to be a meeting participant. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. Yes. So it's not just chairing effective meetings, but how do yeah. I participate in these meetings that's going to make it better for everyone? Because so often we just, we're just passengers. We just think, oh, yeah. this is such a crap meeting. Why am yeah. I here? Yeah, well, then, if you're on Zoom, better. you just turn your video off and do yeah. something else. Check your emails. <laughs> <laughs> Make sure the camera's not on while your cat comes in. Yeah. Or even worse, that gets captured on YouTube and goes viral. <laughs> Oh, so, oh, Jane, we need to finish. We've we've rambled on oh, for ages and oh, I could talk so about this for ages. I think it's such an important thing. Let's have your, your top three tips. What would your top three tips be for, I guess, surviving meetings and, and making making meetings better? Well, let's go back and say, let's start with, don't forget that you're, that you're thinking about the meeting as a dinner party. How are you going to make it fun as well as functional? And how are you going to enable everybody to have a voice and participate. So I guess those would be um, my top three tips. Great. Thank you. And, and for me, the things that have come out of that is a learn how to listen, to understand, not to listen and yes, but learn how to express your own reasoning and intent behind stuff. And actually the power of just being a bit tentative, not sort of making these statements, but actually checking stuff out with your colleagues mm-hmm. and, and not just being a, a passive participant, but actively trying to make things make things better. But Jane, that was really, really fascinating and helpful. Now I know you've got a a course, and you're you're relaunching this in in November, and I'm sure there might be people that are quite interested in in coming on it. Can you just very briefly tell us about that? Yes, of course. So it's called the power of resolutionary thinking, and it is about how do we as well. It's it, I'll tell you very briefly. It's about the three levels of professional development. The first level, uh, whatever we do, we learn the skills. The second level, we learn how to apply those in context. And the third level is a growing level of awareness of ourselves and how we affect situations that we're in, either negatively or positively. Sometimes we're unaware of our own impact. So it's uh, that's the framework for the course. So that it's understanding, a better understanding of how to manage change, challenge and crisis or conflict by understanding our own journey. So we go through this journey. It actually follows a map. And we go through this journey of uh, what are some of the storms I've had to experience in my in my life that affect how I am? Why do I get stuck in this murky swamp of reality that I've talked up before? How do I make decisions when I get to the crossroads? How do I get to a place of greater awareness about myself? So it's a course that I'm running both within organisations. I've been running it with a number of organisations and with GP practices and which individuals are coming on. I've got one starting this afternoon and I've got a GP coming on that. And it it runs over six weeks and it it runs as a a group sort of mastermind where people are sharing their own experiences. And then you've got access to ongoing online learning videos that you can go back to, which give you a lot of these tips and tools and a pocketbook that you can carry with you at all times. (laughs) 
that sounds immensely helpful. You know, hang on, just gonna just gonna get my book out. <laughs> You're starting to hack me off. <laughs> That's literally what people do with my book, Rachel. It's pocket sized, or and people have produced it and said to me, "Look, here's my dog-eared copy of your book. I'm carrying it around with me." <laughs> I can imagine what happens in organisations is like you're having a conversation and someone gets the book out. You think, "Oh no, what have I said?" <laughs> Oh, she's fantastic. got the book she's got the book it's gonna go it's gonna turn tricky brilliant so how can they reach you and find out about that and and all your other work jane uh email is jane at janegun.co.uk i've got a website janegun.co.uk almost every day on linkedin if anybody's on linkedin i post blogs and tips and so on there and uh, i can give you a a link for your show notes rachel which is an access to some of the mini videos that i've done that people might like to look at that's perfect thank you so much so thank you thank you for spending the time coming on the podcast we'll definitely get you back again if that's okay of course thank you so much rachel <laughs> thank you see you soon bye Thanks for listening. If you've enjoyed this episode, then please share it with your friends and colleagues. Please subscribe to my You Are Not A Frog email list and subscribe to the podcast. And if you have enjoyed it, then please leave me a rating wherever you listen to your podcasts. So keep well, everyone. You're doing a great job. You got this.